does the Esau passage in Hebrews 12 teach that you can be a person who you had the truth for a while, you sinned, maybe you fell into a uh, you know, a period of sins, weeks, months, year, whatever. And now you want to repent, but you can't. You desperately want to repent. You want to be made right with God. You want to find salvation. You know that Jesus is the truth. The gospel is true. And you want it for yourself, but you feel like you can't repent, that that maybe you, f- you feel all this fear that your repentance isn't real, it's not genuine, and, and that God isn't going to, in essence, let you repent. Was Esau, in this passage, trying to repent, trying to turn away from his sin, trying to turn to God in faith, but God was, in essence, saying, no, I'm not going to let you do that, or, or Esau had sinned so much, hardened his heart so much that he could no longer truly do that. Is that what this passage is saying. That's that's what I'm going to talk about in this video. This is something that so many people struggle with. I know I've talked to some people at one point in my life. I was one of those people who was just terrified by passages like these. And there's teachers out there. I, I don't like throwing out names, but, but John Piper, who uh, is a very popular teacher that I love and respect, but this is one place that I really disagree with the way he interprets this. And I think that the way he handles it is damaging to people, uh, those that are really concerned with this passage, that are trying to figure it out and trying to find hope. Um, there's hundreds and probably thousands of people coming to him asking this, uh, asking about this specific verse. And I've, you know, over the past several years, I've listened to multiple of his of sermons and, and Q&A videos and things like that where he handles uh, this passage and talks about it. And it, it, in a nutshell, he says that Esau, yes, it's possible to become like Esau where you, you have so sinned, so hard in your heart that now you desperately want to repent. You desperately long for salvation, but you can't, basically you can't do it in the right way. You can't repent in the right way. And so so you're just going to have to live the rest of your life wanting to repent, but knowing that you can't and knowing that you've basically, you've sealed your your fate. God's basically shut the door, locked you out. You had your chance. It's over. You have nothing but hell to look forward to. That is uh, a, a, maybe a kind of rough way, but I think an accurate way of explaining quickly the way John Piper interprets this. And why, why I bring this up is because there are, again, there's so many people coming to him asking about this verse. People that are terrified, people that are hopeless, people people that are desperate, that are convinced that, or, or, or trying to figure out if they, they should be convinced that they're past the point of no return. They want to repent, but when they're coming across this passage and when they come across teachings that John Piper, unfortunately, is putting out about this passage. They're being told that, um, yeah, it's impossible. You you had your chance and you you kind of blew it. And there, there's more to that. I think in, in a lot of those videos, there's actually a lot of good encouragement that John Piper gives in the midst of that. But I think, unfortunately, it, it, um, it ends up in this place where people, I think, are pushed into deeper condemnation and hopelessness. Now, I know this because I know that back... You know, many years ago when I was struggling with this passage, I've, I'm very fortunate that I didn't come across John Piper's videos or teachings on this, uh, to be honest, because I, if I had, it, it would have been something that just drove the nail of condemnation and fear deeper down into my heart and um, would have really been just this weight of evidence to further condemn me and further solidify my feelings of, of hopelessness. So, um so I, I, having come from a period of my life wrestling with this whole question of the unpardonable sin, uh, the unforgivable sin, I know how important it is how teachers handle these verses. And I think teachers like John Piper who confirm that this is teaching that Esau wanted to repent but could not, I think it's, it's wrong and I think it's harmful to those who are hearing that who are sincerely trying to repent. Now, the 
it's kind of ironic, I feel like, when you listen to videos like John Piper and he's talking about this possibility of people desperately wanting to repent. And you even think about that concept of somebody who longs to repent. They they believe in the gospel. They know it's true. They know Jesus is true. They know God is 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 true and he's he's the way they want to live their life. They want to live their life with him and for him, but they feel like they can't. They feel like they're not being allowed or permitted to truly repent. But that desire to repent is itself, I think, a, a, a pretty obvious indication that that person's uh, heart is already experiencing some measure of repentance. If you are wanting to repent, well, that means that your mind is is in some way changed about your sin where you're saying, I, I don't want sin. Yes, I might still be struggling with it. I might still be feeling pulled to it. I might still be even stumbling in it, but I truly want God to help me out of this. But then again, you're feeling that that fear of, but God's basically locked me into this and I can't get out of it. I can't repent. But to desire to repent is itself, I think, at least a aspect of or the beginnings of repentance, of true repentance. So I think before um, I get into this video, and if, if you're somebody that wrestles with this passage, just I'm going to try to keep this as short as possible, but I think there's several things I want to point out in this uh in this verse, in this passage of scripture, Hebrews 12, that I, I really think will be helpful for you. Um, I know I could just do like a five minute video, but uh, I I know that when I was wrestling with this, I, I needed more than a you know two to five minute video covering this. I wanted to have somebody who could um, kind of pull apart some of the, the specifics of this verse and prove to me that it wasn't actually telling me um, that I was in the sort of condemnation that I was fearing, that I couldn't repent. And so, so before I jump into that, though, I think it's important to define repentance. What is repentance? Repentance is a change of mind. It's, it's where you thought one way about something, and now you think another way. And often I think, obviously, this relates to sin. It relates to God, where before repentance, we thought, one way about God, our thinking wasn't correct about him, where maybe before we saw him as this uh, overbearing, burdensome, uh, Zeus-like figure, whatever whatever it might be. But when you understand the truth, your mind changes about God, and that allows you to come to him rather than staying in a distance from him. But repentance simply means, biblically, it's 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 referring to a, a change of a person's mind. With that said, I'm going to jump into Hebrews 12. Hebrews 12, 15 through 17. See to it that no one comes short of the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springing up causes trouble, and by it many become defiled, that there be no sexually immoral or godless person like Esau, who sold his own birthright for a single meal. For you know that even afterward, when he wanted to inherit the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no place for repentance, though he sought it with tears. So that that right there, that's the part that causes people trouble. Because here you have it seemingly Esau, after he had made this mistake, he tried to repent, and couldn't. He, he sought after repentance. He tried as hard as he could to change, change his mind and to turn back to God. But with all of his efforts, with all of his energies, with all of his tears, with all of his begging and pleading, he couldn't change his mind. He couldn't make himself repent. Okay, that's, I'm, I'm telling you what what we often think this is saying, what so many people fear it's saying, I don't think that is what this is saying. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to read you a part from a commentary from Albert Barnes' notes on the Bible that talks about his explanation for this passage. This explanation from Albert Barnes was hugely helpful for me 
when I read through it when I was in the middle of wrestling with this passage. So I'm going to read it and then we're going to talk about some things that he says. So this is Albert Barnes commentary on the Esau passage in Hebrews 12. For you know how that afterward, when he came to his father and earnestly besought him to reverse the sentence which he had pronounced, see Genesis 27, 34 through 40, that's where this whole uh, story takes place. The blessing here referred to was not that of the birthright, which he knew he could not regain, but that pronounced by the father, Isaac, on him whom he regarded as his firstborn son. This Jacob obtained by fraud when Isaac really meant to bestow it on Esau. So Esau is the firstborn son. He was supposed to get the blessing, but Jacob uh, basically through deception caused his father Isaac, who was blind, to bestow that blessing on Jacob without knowing. He thought he was giving it to Esau, but he was giving it to Jacob. Um, So Isaac appears to have been ignorant wholly of the bargain which Jacob and Esau had made in regard to the birthright. So before all that had taken place, Jacob had bought Esau's birthright. Esau as the firstborn son had special privileges as the firstborn son, and he had a birthright, which he sold to Jacob for one bowl of stew, which has a ton of symbolism when it comes to um, the way Hebrews 12 looks back at this story. So Isaac appears to have been ignorant wholly of the bargain with which Jacob and Esau had made in regard to the birthright. And Jacob and his mother contrived in this way to have that confirmed which Jacob had obtained by Esau by a contract. The sanction of the father, it seems, was necessary before it could be made sure. And Rebekah and Jacob understood that the dying blessing of the aged patriarch would establish it all. It was obtained by dishonesty on the part of Jacob, but so far as Esau was concerned, it was an act of righteous retribution for the little regard he had shown for the honor of his birth." Now, this is where he gets into the specific troubling uh, verse. He found no place for repentance or way to change his mind. That is, no place for repentance in the mind of Isaac or no way to change his mind. No way to change Isaac's mind is what he's saying. Remember again, repentance means a change of mind. It does not mean that Esau earnestly sought to repent and could not but that when once the blessing had passed the lips of his father, he found it impossible to change it. Isaac firmly decided that he had pronounced the blessing, and though it had been obtained by fraud, yet as it was of the nature of a divine prediction, it could not now be changed. He had not indeed intended that it should be thus. He had pronounced a blessing on another which had been designed for him, but still the benediction had been given. The prophetic words had been pronounced. By divine direction, the truth had been spoken. And how could it be changed? It was impossible now to reverse the divine purposes in the case, and hence the blessing must stand as it had been spoken. Isaac did, however, all that could be done. He gave a benediction to his son Esau, though of far inferior value, to what he had pronounced on the fraudulent Jacob. So that's all. You can find that story in Genesis 27, 39 through 40. So though he sought it carefully with tears, he sought to change the purpose of his father, but he could not do it. The meaning and bearing of this passage as used by the apostle may be easily understood. Okay, so one, the decision of God on the human character and destiny will soon be pronounced. That decision will be according to truth and cannot be changed. So what, what is it that cannot be changed, what he's saying? I, I, again, this, this isn't the Bible. This is a Bible commentator. But I think, um, I think he's making a very good point. Um, so what is it that could not be changed that he's saying? It's, it's not Esau that, that wasn't changing his mind. It was that Esau couldn't get Isaac to change his mind. Isaac had passed this blessing. He he had passed his verdict. He had blessed Jacob. Esau was trying to get him to reverse that decision and to give the blessing to Esau, but he couldn't get Isaac to change his mind. Go, I would I would encourage you to go and read this this story in Genesis. And I think when you 
read it with these things in mind, it really begins to clear up, I think, what Hebrews 12, the warning being given, is really meaning and what it's not. I think it brings a lot of clarity. And again, this this was so helpful to me when I came across it. This explanation was so helpful and it seemed to make so much more sense out of the warning in Hebrews 12. It made so much more sense. It, 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 it gave me hope and it seemed to line up so much better with the actual stories being referred to in Genesis. So, so again, he says, the decision of God on the human character and destiny will soon be pronounced. The decision will be according to truth and cannot be changed. So what I think this is referring to, this is like, there is a finality in this warning. There is something that is unchangeable. There's something that is, um, you know, you can get locked into it. But I don't think it's referring to this warning isn't being given to something that um, can happen in this life now. This is a warning about what could happen, what will happen at the final judgment for those who abandon and reject faith in Christ unto death. So this is, this is Esau, uh, who represents, I think, a person who has neglected the faith, who has abandoned it for a bowl of stew or has abandoned it for the temporary, temporary pleasures of this world. They've exchanged faith in Christ for whatever it is. And at the final judgment, though they seek repentance in the mind of God, they're going to, they might beg and plead for him to change his mind about the verdict of judgment that he will pass on them. But at that point, there will be no chance. Though they might change their mind, though they, I think they may repent. I think they will change their minds about how they live their life and they will desperately wish they could do things differently but it'll be too late. At the judgment, it will be too late. So I don't think this is saying that here and now you can get to a point where it will be too late. It's not saying in this life, it will be too late if you've done X, Y, and Z. It's saying that if you cross over into the next life, into the time of judgment, then uh, if you've crossed over into that in a state of willfully denying Jesus and the gospel, then yes, at that point, it will be too late. So number two here, he says, if we should despise our privileges as Esau did, his birthright, which, which I think is a picture of our inheritance in Christ, and renounce our religion, it would be impossible to recover what we had lost. There would be no possibility of changing the divine decision in the case, for it would be determined forever. This passage, therefore, should not be alleged to show that a sinner cannot repent or that he cannot find place for repentance or assistance to enable him to repent. And isn't that what so many people are terrified of by this passage? They feel like it's saying they cannot repent, they can't find a place for repentance even though they want it, or, or that God's just not giving them the right assistance to enable them to repent. But that's not what this is saying. So he's, and he's saying this passage should not be alleged to show, again, that a sinner uh, cannot repent or that tears and sorrow for sin would be of no avail. For it teaches none of these things, which I agree with. Uh, but it should be used to keep us from disregarding our privileges, from turning away from the true religion, from slighting the favors of the gospel and from neglecting religion until death comes. Because when God has once pronounced a sentence excluding us from his favor, which that that's going to happen, not now, that doesn't happen in this life. That's going to happen at the judgment. When God has pronounced a sentence excluding us from his favor, no tears or pleading or effort of our own can change him. The sentence which he pronounces on the scoffer, the impenitent, the hypocrite, and the apostate is one that will abide forever without change. This passage, therefore, is in accordance with the doctrine more than once stated before in this epistle, that if a Christian should really apostatize, it would be impossible that he should be saved. And then he, he refers to his notes on Hebrews 6, 1 through 6. So, 
what he's saying is that this warning is referencing what can happen to a person at the final judgment. He's not telling these believers that uh, he's not giving a warning that that goes something like this. Like, hey, guys, if you if you sin in this way or if you you better watch out, because if you've sinned too much, if you backslide too far, you're going to get in the place to where your heart's so hard that you might then realize what you've done. You might realize that you you've um, you know, you're you're in danger. You might realize that you've sinned greatly against God and you want to repent. But you could get to this place where you can't repent, even if you want to. That, that's not what he's saying. What he's saying is that, listen, if you guys abandon faith in Christ, which is the whole context of Hebrews is about these believers being tempted to, to leave, to forsake, to walk away from their faith in God, to abandon it for something else. And he's warning, saying, listen, if you do that, Unto death, if you stay in that state, again, it's not just this temporary one-time thing. It's it's a perpetual, persistent, and uh, present tense state of refusing Christ. If you stay in that till death, when you pass over into that time when the judgment will be given by God, you will there will be no chance to repent. He's saying you will be like Esau, who is who is laid out before his father, who has pronounced the judgment of blessing on believers and the the rejection of unbelievers, and no amount of begging or pleading or crying will be able to change God's mind at that time. Just as Esau begged and pleaded for Isaac, his father, to change the the verdict he had passed to to give him the blessing, but he found no place for repentance. Again, it wasn't. It wasn't that Esau wasn't able to repent. I don't think that's what it's saying. I think it's saying he couldn't get Isaac to repent. His his repentance, the change of mind, the desire that Esau had to to basically have a do over was denied. What what was done was done. But that that is a reality for the time of judgment. That's not today. That's not in this life. That's in the next life. That is the time where what is done is done. How you have chosen to live your life will be sealed. That that you will we will not get do-overs. I don't believe the Bible teaches that there will be do-overs. We in this life are deciding who our allegiance is to. Whether our allegiance and faith is going to be put in Christ, in the gospel, and in the goodness of God, or whether we will embrace unbelief in our hearts, doubt God's goodness, and abandon a, a, uh, a persisted in and enduring faith in him. For those who abandon faith, for those who deny Jesus at the judgment, they will not be able to take that back. Esau wanted to take it back. He wanted to, again, have a do-over. He wanted to undo what had been done. At the judgment, we will not be able to undo what we have done in this life. And at that time, God will pass his judgment for those who have rejected him, have rejected their birthright, right? As Esau did, he, he despised it. He, he counted it as a worthless thing and traded his birthright for a single bowl of stew. For those who do that in this life, which I think for us, that's equivalent to us trading our inheritance in Christ, trading the, the joy of in Jesus, trading our faith in God for the temporary pleasures of sin, or anything else that you might put in it. So this is referring to, this is a warning being given that is directed at what will happen, what can happen at the judgment. So I see that rather than the interpretation that this is saying Esau desperately wanted to repent but could not, or that you might desperately want to repent and cannot, instead of that being what this is saying, I think there, there's two options here. Um, and I think these kind of go together. So one would be, it wasn't Esau who couldn't repent, but rather Esau couldn't get Isaac to repent. Esau tried to convince Isaac to change his mind about the blessing, but he could not get him to change his mind or repent. Again, repenting meaning change of mind. Uh, two, this represents the final judgment. When an unbeliever may at that time repent, but will find no place for it before God. In other words, their repentance won't be able to change God's mind, just as Esau wasn't able to change Isaac's mind. 
Like Hebrews 6, this is not referring to some single specific sin or even repeated sins that then lock you out of repentance and salvation and seal your fate. Esau's actions picture a continued in and persistent state of despising the gospel and departing entirely from faith in God to the point of death. So I'm going to pull out some of the things in this story that uh, the story from Genesis that uh, these things represent. So Esau, I think, represents a person who lays aside their faith in Christ in this life in exchange for sin, comfort, or escaping persecution. So Esau traded his birthright for, again, a bowl of stew. Esau chose the temporary pleasures of this life. That's that's what is pictured by his action of trading his birthright to Jacob for that bowl of stew. But I think a great contrast for that is back in Hebrews 11, just a chapter before, where it says about Moses, it says, By faith, Moses, when he was grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to be mistreated with the people of God than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. So unlike Esau, Moses, when faced with situations in his life where the easy route, the route to relieve his discomfort and his his pain, his suffering, whatever it was, he could have embraced something. He could have embraced what this says, the fleeting pleasures of sin. But rather than embracing that and alleviating his his suffering or his his need for endurance and faith in that time, he chose to continue in suffering. Esau, the the what's illustrated, I think, in the story of Esau, where Esau, you know, the story where he sells his birthright, he's hungry, he tells Jacob, I'm, you know, I'm about to die unless I eat, basically, which is just ridiculous. But Esau, what that that story illustrates is is one who is facing the pain and the the suffering that that comes along with self-denial. Jesus said, unless you deny yourself, take up your cross daily and follow me, you can't be my disciple. Following Jesus requires painful self-denial, which he gives grace for, but it does require endurance and going through suffering and and we become weary and discouraged and, and we have to choose like Moses to keep embracing faith rather than taking the the exit route of embracing the fleeting pleasures of sin. Esau when he was in that place he was hungry, he was tired. He in that moment where he should have endured, he chose the easy way out. He chose the temporary pleasure of the bowl of stew rather than enduring and and he counted his birthright of of lesser value than that bowl of stew that's what happens when we that's the warning being given in uh, in hebrews if we in the face of temptation and trials and suffering in this life as we follow jesus those things will come if we choose that our faith in christ is not worth continuing with that as a Christian, we have to continually endure temptation. We have to continually endure um, going through trials and suffering and, and things that Jesus promised to those who believe in him. Again, we have to deny ourselves and follow him. That means a certain measure of, of pain and suffering that you have to endure to follow Jesus. The warning being given, what il- the story of Esau trading his birthright illustrates, is that we can choose that it's not worth it. We can say, this just isn't worth enduring. This isn't worth continuing in my self-denial. Jesus isn't worth it. My birthright, my inheritance in Christ isn't worth it. We can devalue it and choose to embrace whatever it is that this world is offering to alleviate our discomfort and our pain in this life. That's what Esau did. And again, that's contrasted with Moses who chose the way of faith. Um, number two, the bowl of stew represents whatever it is in this life that a person may so strongly desire that they decide it is more valuable and worthy than their faith in Christ. They decide they just cannot live without that bowl of stew. And so they, in essence, trade away their faith in Christ and inheritance in him 
for whatever earthly comfort or pleasure they are longing for. Sin, pleasure, comfort, avoidance of persecution, etc. So sin and passing pleasures of this world are pictured by that measly bowl of soup that Esau traded his birthright for. Um, number three, the blessing. The blessing that Isaac gave to Jacob. It represents our inheritance in Christ that we freely receive through faith. Hebrews 12 warns that this blessing, this inheritance, can be forfeited if a person becomes a, as, as Hebrews 12 describes Esau, a profane and godless person who devalues the worth of Christ and the life to come and exchanges it for a measly bowl of soup. That's the warning being given here. So John Piper brings up a, a good point in, in his explanation. Um, he, he has multiple videos where he talks about this, and I strongly disagree actually with him and, and how he interprets um, the majority of this passage, but there's parts of it that I think he draws out some good points. So, so John Piper, he says, uh, which brings us finally to Jesus. In Hebrews 12, Jesus is contrasted with Esau. Esau cannot endure missing one meal for the joy of his inheritance. Uh, that's referred to in Hebrews 12, 16. But Jesus endured the cross for the joy set before him. That's in Hebrews 12, 2. It is a striking parallel in the original Greek evident in our English. So here's the parallel between Esau and Jesus. So Esau, who for a single meal sold his birthright. And then Jesus who for the joy set before him, endured the cross. So Hebrews is giving both a warning and an exhortation, a warning to not be like Esau and to be like Jesus, to look at the example of Jesus, to fix your eyes on him, and to not be like Esau, who for a single meal sold his birthright, but rather be like Jesus, who did not look at what was seen, but looked at what was unseen, and for the joy set before him, endured the cross. So then John Piper says, we are all cursed with the madness of Esau. We inherit it from Adam and Eve, who chose one bite of fruit over our eternal joy with God. We are all afflicted with congenital, culpable irrationality. Uh, one bite of fruit, chose one bite of fruit over our eternal joy with God. And that's the warning, that's the, that's the warning being given. That's the concept, the idea that the author of Hebrews is trying to get these people to grasp, that to trade Jesus for anything will be ultimately equivalent to what Esau did, will be equivalent to trading eternal joy with Jesus for a, a single bite of fruit, for a single bowl of soup. It's not worth the trade-off. Number four, in this story, Isaac represents God at the final judgment, who will render to each one according to his deeds. Isaac rejected Esau and refused to give him the blessing once he had already passed the verdict. In the same way, God at the final judgment will reject all those who have rejected him. Those who have casted away faith in Christ as if it is a worthless thing, as Esau cast away his birthright, will realize their folly at the judgment. As Esau begged and pleaded for Isaac to undo his verdict but was rejected, so it will be for those who have forsaken Christ in this life. This is, this is not a pleasant picture. And though I think I'm removing what I think is a lot of the unnecessary fear surrounding this passage. I think people have so much unnecessary fearfulness about this because they're they're putting the finalities of these warnings in the wrong location on the timeline, if that makes sense. But th these are serious warnings. This is a very serious warning, sobering reminder that we we've gotta we've got to be serious about our faith in Jesus. And this isn't something that produces fearfulness in us, but but if we're being tempted or drawn away as the Hebrews were to trade off, to depart from faith in God, then we need to be aware of what is at stake. And what is at stake is that we will find ourselves, like Esau, 
at the foot of Isaac, again, who's who I think is a representation of God, we will realize the folly that we lived in in this life if, if for those who abandon him. And though they beg and plead for God to change his mind, like Isaac, God won't change his mind. It will be done. No, I want to note again, this is not talking about a single action of sin or even repeated sin or occasional stumbling. This is talking about a decisive choice by a person to entirely cast aside their faith in Christ in exchange for something else. I think that's worth repeating over and over because that's the idea that so many people get in their heads. Um, when they commit you know, a single sin or they have this period of backsliding and then they become convinced, oh, I'm an Esau. It's impossible for me to repent. And that is just missing the point. Esau pictures somebody who goes into death rejecting Christ, not somebody who had a temporary moment or moments of rejecting or denying Christ. Number five, the word afterward is used in this passage in Hebrews. Um, and I think that afterward pictures or represents that time when God's final judgment has been passed or the time after this life in the next. So Hebrews 12, 17 says, For you know that even afterward, when he, when Esau wanted to inherit the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no place for repentance, though he sought it with tears. So the afterward here pictures that final judgment of God. It, afterward, when, when I see afterward there, I think, again, if we live this life in rejection of Christ, then afterward, meaning in the next life, when we want to inherit the blessing, when we realize the foolishness of what we've done, we will be rejected because at that time, we're going to find no place for repentance. We're going to find no place for a change of mind in the mind of God. Or we're going to find in our own efforts to repent and change the circumstances, we're going to find that it, it has no effect. It, it won't work. This warning tells us that if we obstinately refuse God and the gospel in this life, then afterward, i.e. after this life is over, and God passes his final judgment on us, we will find no place for repentance. We won't be able to repent and change God's mind at the judgment. In this life, we decide who we are going to be. We decide whether we will confess the truth of who God is with our lives, or whether we will deny the truth by how we live. Once our lives are over, there are no do-overs. Okay, so three points just to summarize what I think you should take away from this warning, what you should take away from it and what you should not. Just to be very clear, uh, I want you guys who are struggling with this to go away without a doubt in your mind what, what, I, what this is warning about and, and again, what it's not warning about. I want you to be able to go away from this passage unchained, unbound by this passage that is one of, of several, one of the main ones that ties up so many people, again, in this question surrounding the unpardonable, the unforgivable sin, it's, this is one of the main ones that causes people to, to just be bound up in condemnation, fear, depression, etc. And so I want you to be able to go away with at least this one off the table, with this one no longer being part of the scriptures that are chaining you down. I want you to be able to rest at ease knowing that this is not condemning you as one who cannot repent. So the three things from everything I've said that I want you to take away and that I think we should all take away from the warnings being given here. For those who forsake faith in Christ in this life, they will not be able to repent and change their minds at the final judgment. They will may be filled with regret and seek repentance afterwards, but it will be too late. They will see that they traded the priceless treasure of Christ for the worthless temporary pleasures of sin. Okay, so this is afterward. This is referring to not this life, but a warning about the final judgment. Two, Esau found no place for repentance, meaning his repentance had no impact on Isaac's decision. It wasn't that Esau couldn't repent himself. It was that he couldn't, his repentance had no place. It had no effect. It, it, it His change of mind, it, it didn't do anything. It didn't accomplish anything. He couldn't change Isaac's decision. 
In other words, a person who has rejected Christ in this life will at the judgment seat see all that he has thrown away. He might bitterly weep and ask God for the blessing, but no amount of tears or pleading will change God's mind once the verdict is passed. So this warning concerns something that can happen at the final judgment, not now. You really need, if you're wrestling with this passage, to take that point away from this video, I think. Okay, number three, and this is this is maybe the most important point that you should take away. I want you to hear this if you're wrestling with this passage. This is not saying that you can desperately want to repent but not be able to. Okay, Hebrews, uh, the beginning chapters, um, in Hebrews 3, it says, Today, if you hear his voice, don't harden your heart. The idea being conveyed over and over in Hebrews is that today, now, is the time that Christ has provided full and abundant redemption to us for for anyone. There, there's a passage in Hebrews where it says, Jesus, he is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him. So this idea that in this time we can get in a place where God has basically passed this verdict of, of condemned, guilty, no possibility of repentance, no possibility of salvation. I just think that that is a misunderstanding of the age that we are in. We are in an age of grace. We are in the age of the new covenant. We are in the time of salvation. Um, 2 Corinthians 6, 2, it says, in the time of my favor, I heard you. He's quoting one of the prophets, Paul is. And in the day of salvation, I helped you. Now listen to this. He says, I tell you, now is the time of God's favor. Now is the day of salvation. Now is not the time that God is passing verdicts of condemnation on people. Yes, there, there's judgment in this life. Yes, there is uh, consequences for sin and things like that. But, but overall, now is the time of salvation. Because of what Jesus accomplished in his death on the cross and his resurrection, as he provided a time of salvation for people. And that is what we are in today. Today, it says, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. And so for those of you who are feeling like you've maybe gotten to this point where you've gone too far, you've gone past the point of no return, you can't repent. I'm telling you, you've got to look at verses like this that override those sort of concepts, okay? Because now is not the day of condemnation. Now is not the time of, of, of wrath and judgment and of being locked out of salvation. Today is the day of salvation. This is Jesus's blood. Jesus's redemption has covered everything um, that you might have done or that you might do. And the only thing in this day, in, because it's the day of God's favor, because it's the day of salvation, the only thing that could lock us out of receiving what Jesus has done is that we would reject it, that we would persist in refusing it. And that's why over and over in Hebrews, it's constantly saying, don't refuse him. Don't reject him. Don't walk away from the faith. And again, it's not saying don't have this. Yes, don't have a one-time moment of doing that or, or momentary um, period of doing that. It's saying don't continue in that. Don't, don't continue in that until death. Now is the time of God's favor. Okay, now, now is not the time. Uh, that God is passing verdicts on people saying, this person has sinned so much, he's sinned in this way, and so he's locked out of salvation. I've locked the doors for him. Or, or uh, you know, this person has pronounced some sort of specific curse. I, I w I've been talking to people who, who have said some specific phrase or something that they've said to the Holy Spirit, um, and, and they're afraid that that is the unpardonable sin. And now because they said that specific phrase, they're locked out of salvation. Okay, listen, none of these warnings, even the unpardonable sin passage uh, that we covered in, in a couple of videos ago, none of these warnings are warning against things like that. That is not the unpardonable sin. Momentary actions or even uh, uh, patterns of struggling with sin are not the unpardonable sin. Yet unpardonable sin, what is being warned against here is an absolute determination to abandon faith, to walk away from Jesus. It's a resolute decision that you're you're not believing God anymore and you're embracing something else. That's what's being warned against here. You have not locked yourself out of salvation. 
Today is the day of salvation. You've not locked yourself out of God's favor. Today is the, the day of God's favor toward you. You can stop right now where you're at and think about this day that God has made. This is the day that the Lord has made. And because of Jesus, he has made this a day of favor toward you and toward me. And so those condemning thoughts that creep up into our minds, even, even still these thoughts can come into my mind when I've maybe not walked in obedience as well as I, I, I know I should, or, or I've failed in different areas. We can kind of slip into this thought that, that God wants to kind of set us off to the side and set us on the shelf where we've somehow disqualified ourselves from, from his, his full acceptance or blessing. But now, right now, there are no contingencies put on this. It doesn't say now is the time of God's favor toward you unless you've done X, Y, and Z. There's no exceptions here. So for all of us, for all of you, no matter what sins you've committed, even if you've had a period where maybe you were walking in the faith and then you, you, you chose that you don't even believe in Jesus anymore, but maybe now you want to come back to him, for you and for anybody else, now is the day, now is the time of God's favor. Now is the day of salvation. If you want to repent, then you can. And I would say again, if you want to repent, but you fear that you can't repent, you fear that you're like Esau um, and you're, you're misunderstanding that passage and thinking it's telling you, you can't find a place for repentance or you're just trying to repent, but you can't repent in a right way. If you want to repent, then I believe that that shows that repentance is already taking place in some degree. There's already a change of mind that has happened in you where, where you are acknowledging the truth about God and probably acknowledging truth about your sin and you're wanting to be in the truth. Even if you're messy, even if you've got a lot of junk going on in your mind and heart, that's kind of beside the point. What matters is that if you've changed your mind and you're, you're saying, even with all of my junk, I want, I want to follow God. I want, I want to be restored to him. I want to, I sincerely want to repent. I'm just afraid I can't. I'm telling you, you can. God isn't locking you out of repentance. He's not withholding the ability to repent from you. If you want to repent, then you need to know that you are already in the process of repenting. And now I think what you need to do is rather than focusing on yourself and desperately searching inside to see if, if your repentance is good enough, if it's, if it's right enough, if, it's, if your repentance has enough love for God in it, does your repentance have the right measure of hatred towards sin? I think all these things that we get so wrapped up in, which is all just self-focus, it all boils down to I think pride and self-trust where we're looking inside of ourselves to see if there's something in us that we think can give us comfort to think that our relationship with God can be right. Because I'm, I'm, I'm looking at myself and, oh, I see all this love for God or I see all this hatred towards sin. That must mean I'm, I'm doing okay. Um, I think sometimes it's good to, to look inside to kind of analyze the condition of our heart. But I think we often look and focus and stay too long focused on ourselves. And so don't, don't focus on the spiritual feelings that you may or may not be having. Don't rely on that. Again, if you want to repent, if you have that simple desire, even though your feelings and emotions may be all wacky and not what they should be, if you want to repent, and I think that shows there is a change of mind happening in you in relation to sin and God. If you want, if you want to stop your patterns of sin, if you want to find God's will for your life, if you want to get in the place of obedience to Him, that is repentance. Um, if 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 it's if that desire is going to where you are willing to do what you need to do, you're willing to do what what you need to do to um, to be in God's will then I think God's, God's going to help you to do that. So again, what I think you should do is stop focusing on your insides and what you are and what you are not and start looking up at Christ and all that he is. Uh, there's a quote from someone, I can't remember who it is. It might, might be Charles Spurgeon or something like that. I don't know who it is, but, but he says something to the extent of for every glance 
we 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 give to ourselves. For every time we glance at ourselves, we should glance back at Christ a thousand times more, or something like that. Um, and I think that's what you people who are wrestling with the unpardonable sin and that terror that it can produce, you've got to learn to do that. You've got to learn that for for every time you look at yourself and all that you aren't and you see in yourself all your failures, all your junk, all your sin, every time you look at all that you are not, you need to look back up a thousand times more at all that Christ is. Because this whole thing, Christianity, is not about what you are. It's not about how much love you can bring to God, how much hatred towards sin you can produce. And only when you do that will God will God say, oh, look, that guy, you know, that that person has has gotten himself in line. So uh, I guess I'll help him. That that's not how this that's not how this thing works. That's the point of the gospel is that it's while while we were yet weak, is Romans 5, Christ died for us. It's while we can still look in ourselves and see so much junk and things that aren't what they should be. It's while we are still yet in that condition that we can look to God. And, and not only did Christ die for us while we are in that condition, but he, he, he embraces us now. God calls us his children. Not, not after we fix all that stuff in us. It's, it's, God doesn't say, okay, you guys who are spiritually sick, go get well, go get better, and then come to me. That's not, that's not what he says. That's not how this works. But I think I, I, this, this relates to so many people, but, but I think this really relates to those who wrestle with the unpardonable sin. And I, I'm saying this because I'm speaking from experience, having been in a period of fearing this whole, this whole concept of the unforgivable sin. My focus and trust was on myself. And I, it, it, by, by the amount of time I was spending looking at, thinking about, meditating on, dwelling on all that I wasn't, all that I wasn't producing, all, you know, I wasn't feeling the right way about God. I, I actually, you know, I had a lot of anger at him at that time. And I, I really didn't like him very much because of the thoughts I was having. And so all these, this junk that I saw inside myself, I took that as evidence that I was blocked off from the grace of God. And in essence, what I was saying is that I thought I had to first figure out how to get well in order for God to then say, okay, well now you can, you know, now you can come inside the house since, you know, you got over your nasty diseases. But the beauty of the gospel is that Jesus came down and walked with sinners. He, 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 he touched the, the lepers. He, he opened the eyes of the blind. He didn't wait for them to do, do that themselves. He did it for those who came to him by faith. And so all of that to say, if you are in this condition of fear and terror and feeling you're locked out from the grace of God, I'm just encouraging you to stop looking so much at yourself and everything that you're not and look at Jesus. Run to Jesus like the leper. Be like the leper who, who you're running to him, diseased, smelly, and everything else. That's what God wants. He, he's, he wants you to run boldly to him, and then he's going to reach out and touch you. And he's the one. It's, it's God's job to produce in you love and affection for him and a hatred for, towards sin. That is the job of the Holy Spirit to do in us. It's not our job to, to, to make that happen in us. If we could produce those things inside of ourselves, then you know you might have a good argument that why did Christ even die? Because if we could fix ourselves, if we could get rid of this sin problem and 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 produce in us love and love for God, hatred towards sin, righteous feelings, things like that, then would there have been a need for Christ? The reason Christ came and did what he did is because we can't do that. And so we've got to stop. You've got to stop focusing in on that and all that you are not, and you need to start focusing on all that Jesus is. And so look to his promises. I, I would say as a, a, an encouragement to begin to take the promises of God. If you're feeling like you're locked out of salvation, what, whatever, you, if it's the Hebrews 6, if it's the Hebrews 12, I, I'm hoping the past couple of videos have helped clear up some of these things. 
but if not, if you're still on that condition, um, I'm just encouraging you to take the promises of God and put more stock, more faith, more trust in God's promises like this, where he's saying today, if you hear his voice, don't harm your heart. He's saying now is the time of God's favor. Now is the day of salvation. Jesus says, anybody who comes to me, I will not drive away. Find specific promises of God that counteract and negate the lies and the condemnation you're feeling. And choose by faith to boldly put more stock, more weight on those promises of God's goodness and mercy than the weight you're putting on the power and condemnation of your own sin. So to close this off, I'm just going to share a few more snippets from some more uh, Bible commentators who are interpreting this Hebrews 12 passage. And, and I'm sharing this because for one, for me in this time, when I found Bible commentator after Bible commentator that were interpreting this passage and they were basically refuting uh, by the way they understood this passage, they were refuting this idea that, you know, I could desperately long to repent, but not be able to. Um, it really helped to see over and over again that so many Jesus-loving, God-fearing, uh, good Bible commentators um, were looking at this passage and coming up with a, a completely different view that I think, one, was filled with so much more hope than the idea that I had. Um and two, just I think lined up so much better with the, the actual stories in Genesis that this um, warning passage is referring to. So for those of you who have really struggled with this Hebrews 12 passage, if, even if you've gotten to this point in the video and you're still, you have your doubts, you still are really wrestling with it. I just hope hearing, hearing these guys might, might be encouraging, might be helpful, might be further clarification and reinforcing some of the things that, that we've said um, in this video. So the first one I'm gonna read is from McLaren's Expositions. And again, this is, this is just little cuts out of these guys' exposition of this Hebrews 12 Esau warning passage. So he says, and now let me turn last of all to what I, venture to consider the misapprehension which these words do not teach. They do not teach that a man may desire to repent with tears and be unable to do so. That, it seems to me, is to assert a staring, stark contradiction. For if a man desired to repent, he must have changed his views as to the conduct of which he desires to repent. And that change of view is the repentance which he desires. Are you catching that? This is what I've been saying, what I started that video saying. If a man desires to repent, that desire shows that he must have changed his views as to the conduct of which he desires to repent. In other words, if you're desiring to repent from your sins, then that shows that you're, to repent from your sins or if you're desiring to turn toward God in faith, that shows that your views of, of whatever it was that before was hindering you from doing that, it proves that your views of those things have changed, being that you're wanting to repent from them. And so he's basically saying that is repentance. I mean, repentance is happening if that's the case for you. Then he finishes off by saying, and if a man desires to repent... There must be in him some measure of regret and sorrow for the conduct of which he desires to repent, considered as sin against God. And that is repentance. Okay, just take that away and think about that if you're, if you're struggling with that fear. Okay, the next one is from Vincent's Word Studies. The phrase place of repentance, this does not mean that Esau was rendered incapable of repentance which is clearly contradicted by what follows. Okay, so what followed is that seemingly Esau was repenting. Seemingly Esau had changed his mind about what had happened, what, what had been done. So he says the words place of repentance mean an opportunity to repair by repenting. He found no way to reverse by repentance what he had done. The penalty could not be reversed in the nature of the case. 
This is clear from Isaac's words in Genesis 27, 33, which the words are, before he came in, I ate it all and blessed him. And indeed he will be blessed. So when Esau came in, started begging Isaac to change the blessing, take it from Jacob, give it back to Esau. Isaac said, no, what is basically what's been done is done. So he's saying again, this isn't that Esau was rendered incapable of repentance, but rather that the penalty could not be reversed in the nature of the case. Okay, last one, uh, Matthew Poole's commentary. And he says, he found no place of repentance as to the giving it with God who gave it and would not alter it, nor with his father who did not repent of giving it to Jacob, but confirmed it. Though he sought it carefully with tears, and this, although he sought the blessing from his father with cries and tears, how therefore should these Hebrews, knowing all this, root out such a root springing up in themselves or others, that they might not be guilty of such sin, lest having despised God's blessing of their own ease, honors, or profits in this world, when they may desire to seek with tears the blessing of the internal inheritance from God, he should irreversibly, irreversibly reject them. So, again, the thought is that, I think from all of these, that this isn't, this isn't a case of Esau trying desperately to repent and to change his mind, but finding that God won't let him or something of that nature. Rather, it's Esau wanting to undo the effects of what he's done, wanting, wanting to undo the, the blessing that had been given to Jacob. And um, he couldn't get Isaac to change his mind in the same way those who deny Christ in this life will not be able to convince God to change his final verdict um, at the judgment. So we got to take faith seriously. I think with all this being said, what's obvious is that there are some serious warnings being given here. But I think it's so important not to misunderstand these warnings because it debilitates a lot of people. But as this passage in Hebrews 12 begins with, he says, see to it that no one misses or falls short of the grace of God. The way we do that, the way we, we, we would fall short of the grace of God is if we choose to, like Esau, trade or exchange our faith in Christ for a bowl of stew. Um, I think in the case of the Hebrews, what a large part of what they were being tempted toward was that, again, they were being persecuted for their faith in Christ. They were being um pressured into going back, reverting to Judaism. For them, I think in a lot of ways, the going back to the old way was their bowl of stew. It, to do that would have relieved so much. It would have just made so many things so much easier. It was just this, you know, but it would be this momentary thing that required that they exchange their birthright in order to eat that soup and to uh, temporarily alleviate their discomfort, the discomfort of their persecutions that they were experiencing. And the author of Hebrews is saying, don't, don't do that. Don't be like Esau. Uh, I think, again, this, this refers to um, sexual sin. He, he, he puts that in the context of this warning. He says, see to it that nobody is sexually immoral. So it doesn't just refer to that. Um, I think this within the context, what the Hebrews were being tempted to do, but it, it refers to any sin, anything that we might grab onto in exchange for our faith in God. Jesus is worth it. Um, he's worth enduring and faith for. He's worth, he's worth refusing the temporary satisfaction of that bowl of stew and continuing on, pressing on, enduring, just like Jesus, for the joy that we know is set before us to continue to endure the cross and endure the, the temptations, endure the sufferings, Endure the the lies even of, of condemnation and, and fear. Endure whatever it is that, that we have to endure to stay in faith and confidence in God and what he said. Last thing I'm going to leave you with, I'm going to repeat myself because I really want you guys to get this. If you want to repent, you can. You are not locked out of repentance. You have not been rendered. If, if you desire to not sin, if you desire to be right with God, you're not locked out of repentance. Um, I believe that idea, that concept is a lie. If you want to repent, you can. 
And if you want to repent, I think you probably in some measure are. So Jesus said, nobody who comes to him will he turn away. Uh, Psalm 34, it says, nobody who takes refuge in God will be condemned. So wherever you're at, whatever's going on, whatever condemnation you're feeling, make the choice by faith to take refuge in God. And the promise that he gives you, you will not be condemned and he will not turn you away. 